just unmute themselves for one second to give me your verbal consent that you're on board with being recorded and having us use this later. I'd appreciate that. This is Erica. You can use me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. This is Riley and his mom. Yes, it's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, it's okay with Felicity. Great. I see. I'm going to assume I have your okay, and I think everybody else's staff, so I have their okays. Um, okay, so we are going to be started, um, get started. If you could just mute yourself, um, and then if you have any questions as Alex is going, uh, please just, you can throw them right into the chat box and we can answer those questions at the end. Um, first of all, I should say welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I'm Christina Taylor, the Director of Programs and Operations for the Van Cortlandt Park Alliance. And today we have Alex Byrne, who is our Field Scientist and Research Coordinator, who's going to be giving a talk on the uh, ecology of ants in Van Cortlandt Park. So thank you, Alex. All right, so I'll try and make this about half hour, less than half hour. Um, this is basically um, a summarization of work that I've been doing for um, you know three or, or four years within the park to basically assess um, what the community structure is of the terrestrial arthropods. So the, the Van Cronland Park Alliance works a lot in the freshwater aquatic systems of the park. Um, and we do a lot of analysis of the chemistry and the biodiversity, um, but there's still a lot of organismal uh, diversity and really cool behaviors and interesting um, ecological functions that are going on within the forest um, and more terrestrial ecosystems of the park. Um, so basically I've been going into those and looking for um, different things like ants, uh, beetles, and spiders. And this uh, talk will be a focus on the ants um, within the terrestrial ecosystems of the park. So basically, I mean, we're looking at an urban ecology here where we want to integrate as much of uh, an ecosystem and the organisms um, that come along with that, integrate that into our cities, our buildings, our engineering um, as much as possible. Um, Cause there are a lot of uh, benefits, um, everything from water capturing to cooling the actual temperature of the city. Um, and then a lot of these insects provide ecological services such as the aeration of our soils or the pollination of uh, different plants. And so why is it important to go into New York City parks and look for insects and uncover what's there? Um, basically, currently we're going through quite an interesting uh, decline. Um, that's been documented, um, especially over in Europe, um, in terrestrial insects. So these are things like uh, your butterflies and your moths and your beetles. Um, and what they've found is that there's been a, a major decline in, in population numbers over time, which are, are kind of hard to track. But um, from the studies that were done, uh, particularly in Germany, um, they've got good evidence to show a, a significant decline. And this um, information has also hit sort of uh, non-technical literature, such as the insect apocalypses here published in the New York Times. So just from basically from this um, literature, we can sort of extract that the, the insects are, are not doing uh, too well. We need to go out. We need to have understanding of their baseline population numbers and the community composition. So exactly what species are present in what areas. Um, and this is particularly important for New York City, um, where we don't necessarily have um, those types of uh, biodiversity uh, information available to us for, for all the taxa. So I mentioned that we've been looking at both ants, beetles, and spiders. This talk is going to just quickly summarize some of the, the ant work uh, that we have been doing. Um, to look at some of the different types of collection methods that we use. So on the far left, you've got the pitfall trap. That's basically a cup sunk into the ground. Um, 
level with the actual surface and that's filled with some sort of um, liquid where the insect will walk along uh, the ground, fall into the cup and sort of get trapped inside um, that liquid and preserved. Uh, will come along and pick that up and then all the contents within there serve as a single sample. Um, that metal plate above the uh, cup there serves to protect it from um, rainwater and um, keeping your contents within the cup. Uh, we also used a modified uh, form of a flight intercept trap. The flight intercept trap basically is a, is a sheet where an insect is flying along, will hit the sheet and fall into some sort of collection tray. Um, and so the reason we used these two different methods, the pitfall trap and the flight intercept, is it really also gets at the type of uh, locomotion and mobility these insects are using. So the pitfall trap will really um, sort of focus in and, and sample those ground dwelling and, and ground moving um, arthropods. And then those arthropods that are really uh, moving around the forest via their wings, uh, flying around uh, the flight intercept trap will we'll capture them. And then we also uh, sifted leaf litter, uh, basically where you just take any sort of sifter and you take the leaves, you put it through, um, sifting the, the matter inside. Um, the fact is a lot of ant species will be fairly uh, cryptic in terms of where they choose to put their nests. Um, and colony size is also very variable. So very uh, cryptic species with very small colony sizes. Um, we find that's best to be sampled uh, via leaf litter uh, sifting. And then we also use baits. So baits are not depicted here, but basically it's a centrifuge tube that I take with a cotton ball and you can try this pretty much anywhere. And if you leave it out for about 15 minutes, you'll, you should get some ants showing up, but basically a tube with a cotton ball. And then that cotton ball is soaked in a number of different uh, types of nutrients um, to attract the ants um, to, to the actual uh, bait. And so moving on, we're looking at the different study locations. So depicted here is the entirety of, um, of uh, Van Cortland Park. Um, I had transects and traps uh, set up in the Northwest Forest, Vault Hill, uh, the Tibbetts Brook floodplain, and Croton Woods. That totaled to a number of 60 uh, traps across the park. And the reason that this was done across such a wide extent uh, throughout the park is because each one of these different zones gives us a different ecological context to look at exactly what the ant community composition is and give us an idea of their ecology. So Vault Hill being a lot more open habitat, a lot drier, um, less canopy cover, and more sandier soils, we find that there is a oak, hickory, uh, dominated system within the northwest with and there's a lot of topology so meaning that there are elevational gradients um, that are seen in the northwest that aren't seen in other parts of the park the Tibbetts Brook floodplain where you have a saturated soil system um, and you have Croton Woods which we find is more um, sugar maple dominated but also has a lot more um, earthworm um, inundation um, that we've observed so really because Van Cortland Park is so big, we could utilize these different sections and each one of these sections in its own right, um, in terms of its ecological context, could actually serve as its own little mini park. So why exactly did I look at ants? Well, ants make and excavate and aerate soils. So they really are these um, in the absence of our invasive worms and um, and bearing beetles, our, our ants are, are really going in and turning over soil. They're taking material from lower horizons and they're bringing it up to higher horizons in the soil. Um, they're basically, through that action, they are connecting what is occurring above ground and what is occurring below ground. So there are these conduits that allow for things like uh, nutrients to be moved around in the system not only on a sort of a, a plane going this way, but also moving sort of up and down through the soil uh, horizons and column. 
they're highly networked. So what I mean by that is basically if you imagine sort of a, a node-based uh, network system, kind of like uh, the internet, um, each ant is very well connected to other species um, of organisms in that general area. So they'll be interacting with other species of ants. They will be interacting with their food sources, which can be anything from uh, predating on springtails to feeding on the honeydew of, um, of, of aphids. Um, so that really touches on the fact that ants are, are very well um, connected through interactions in um, ecological systems. In urban areas, they're providing a free sanitation service. So they are, con they are foraging, they're adamant uh, foragers. So they expand out from the actual nest, um, of which is the whole center of the colony. And through that, they're going out and they're looking for food. So in the urban areas, when we do dump uh, trash that's of organic nature, so like a food source into a, into a trash can, that has a couple different options. Um, where, but mainly where it's going to end up is going to be the dump. Well, if we have a healthy ant community there, there's been studies shown that it actually can help to reduce the amount of organic matter going into our dump systems. Um, so they provide sort of a, uh, an insect-driven uh, in-situ composting service for us. Ants are abundant and they move around the planet. Um, so in terms of trying to find uh, snakes or, or salamanders, that, that could be quite difficult. But anyone walking around the forest is likely just to, uh, to run into um, one of our, our, our many species of ants. And that just serves to show just how um, abundant they are. And with that high abundance comes the large capacity for them to actually uh, change and alter their environments. So it's drastically seen in species such as the leaf cutters, where they can move into in the tropical zones, where they'll move into a forest and they'll pretty much uh, reduce the foliage off of large tracts of, of, of forest stands. Um, and like I had mentioned before, they have such an important role in the Northeast in soil creation and maintenance and management. And so they, with this comes the huge capacity for change on their part. And the community, in terms of just basic um, survey work in New York City, is largely unknown. So there are um, people uh, like Dr. Amy Savage from Rutgers looking at ants in Manhattan. Uh, Dr. Rob Dunn is looking at ants. He's over in uh, North Carolina looking at ants in Manhattan. Um, but there simply just is not anyone um, that I know looking at the large community of, of possible ant species within the Bronx. Um, so this work is, is quite novel in the respect of, of actually um, documenting what species of ants are living in the Bronx. And so just jumping right to it, um, the summary at the end of, of collecting um, has been about 40 species. Um, so, well, we've, I've got 40 and then there's likely uh, more present. Um, to me, that suggests that we, and within Van Cronin Park, are comparable to larger, more rural uh, preserve-like systems that can be found up in Black Rock Forest. So from, from this data, the larger that we can sort of maintain uh, our urban parks, the, the more ant diversity we'll definitely have. And to, the, uh, to that extent, also, we want to reduce the, the amount of uh, land that gets turned over from a uh, natural uh, state to more developed. Um, we've discovered a genus of uh, polyergus ants. So these are a pretty unique species that is actually on the, um, is a threatened species on the federal endangered species list. And I believe that's the first time in the Bronx anyone's uh, discovered this um, uh, genus and species. And we found them in Vault Hill. So Vault Hill is a, a small open area um, that's very, um, that gets uh, hotter uh, than the other uh, forest areas of the park. Um, and polyergus is known to be found in right-of-ways, 
which suggests to us that um, whatever is going on in Vault Hill is, is somewhat mimicking the uh, right-of-way habitat. And for those of you um, that don't know, the right-of-ways are the areas where the power lines run through. Um, to date, we've seemed to uh, discover one of the most diverse ant, uh, carpenter ant community um, assemblages within New York City. Um, and I, I sort of, uh, that's likely a function of just the diversity of different habitats that we find within Van Corlin Park and the maturity. So we also have um, trees that are large enough DBH to, to house some of these species successfully. We do have an invasive ant species, Nylandaria flavipes, um, and I'm urging that we monitor it and we start looking outside of Van Crowen Park as well to start understanding the extent to uh, how this species has colonized different areas. Um, from re more manipulative research, we've shown that or shown that their nutrition, so what they're actually consuming, and their ability to resist desiccation, or otherwise known as water loss, um, can be an important factor in what species are actually found in um, different areas. And open and dry habitats seem to increase diversity, and we tend to find species that are only found in those areas if that area tends to be open and dry. So management going into how we actually, what plants that we put, how we um, manage our canopy gaps, all these can have um, really interesting consequences for ants. So at the end, the, the take home of this is that our actions within the park um, as uh, stewards, where we're planting uh, native trees, uh, we're maintaining uh, and managing these natural areas, we could um, play a strong role in the, uh, the fate of the diversity and community assembly of these ants. So we're gonna just quickly go through some of the usual suspects that I tend to come across in my traps and give you guys some names um, because to most people, it's just kind of black ants, red ants. Um, so we'll, we'll get a little deeper than that. Um, the, this um, is probably my, my favorite uh, genus. It's something that's come across a lot in the forest system, so that's a Phenogaster. Um, we've got uh, two species, a Phenogaster rudus and fulva, a Phenogaster fulva, rudus being found more within uh, the forest um, environments and fulva being found in more open areas. This genus is important for seed dispersal. So by seed dispersal, I mean that these ants literally go up, um, they uh, pick up a seed and they move it. And so plants can't exactly get up and move around. So the ants do the sort of uh, the bidding for the plants by actually moving them around the forest floor. This could be, this is done with um, spring uh, flowers such as trout lily, uh, Dutchman's breeches, um, blood root, um, all the sort of spring uh, ephemerals that are out right now um, produce what's called an eleazome, which is a a lipid packet that sits on the seed that entices the ants to come over and, and feed on them. And so with that oleosome, the, the plants get a free ride around the forest. They are nesting within dead wood, so they're important in the decomposition, turning that wood over into soil. Bioturbation, which is a fancy way of saying they excavate soils. So a lot of our ants are going to be playing this role in the ecosystem of decomposition of some sort of material and the movement of soil material across different horizons. And if one was to find uh, the uh, a log full of a finagaster, um, they could be easily inoculated into environments uh, by by moving that log into a system. So for instance, if there's an area where there's an isolated uh, bunch of, let's say, uh, blood root, it may be beneficial to actually move these species into the sites to help their expansion. Campanotus, so here we have the carpenter ants. Um, they are, if you're walking down the sidewalk on the border of the park and you see a large black ant that's in this genus Campanotus, uh, they're noted by people because of the um, damage they can cause within houses. 
but within our forest systems, they're doing really important things. It's even thought that um, you know, with it, in the absence of these uh, these foragers, these scavengers, we'd really be um, kind of beyond our ankles in, in insect carcasses, and it would be quite difficult to walk around. So they're aerating soil. They're an important food source for insect insectivorous birds, like uh, woodpeckers and their kin. So this species will be nesting in snags. So a snag is a dead tree, a tree that is dead, no longer really photosynthesizing, doesn't produce leaves, but is still standing. And so the carpenter ants um, will take residence in, in those areas, uh, at least a, a select few species. And that's really what our, our, um, our woodpeckers and their kin are after. And so pictured here is uh, Campanoides chromoides. Uh, we've got a, a species that I don't think has been discovered in um, uh, New York City before. This is Campanoides castaneus. Uh, this is a fairly large um, species that has uh, nocturnal uh, foraging habits, uh, which likely make it uh, more difficult to uh, see. We have the genus Lassius, uh, so this is a wide-ranging uh, species uh, complex. There, we've got, um, I think, at least four or five different species within this genus. Um, something very, a couple notable things is the fact that they form symbiotic relationships with a lot of different insects. I have found things like aphids and mealybugs and scale insects within their nests, with they'll, which they will be using. Um, to excrete a honeydew source from them. Um, basically, um, just like uh, we domesticated our cows um, and we protect them and we get a, a resource from the cows, um, the ants sort of have domesticated these other insects wherein they afford those insects protection, but in return then get um, a sort of a honeydew secretion sugar uh, meal. Um, and they're also increasing uh, nitrogen in the soil. This is a picture of a Lassius nest, a rock that was turned over. Um, this was from the park that I took not too long ago. And you could actually see all those um, white uh, mealybugs in the, in the photograph. And those are essentially uh, their symbionts living within the colony. And the ants are receiving a food source from them. And also, lastly, if you've been walking around on open areas like the, the parade ground, there is a Lassius known as the cornfield ant, and they are the ones generating these small hills in the more sandier areas. We do have um, sort of unique trophic specialists. So to be a trophic specialist, meaning that you eat a very specific um, subset or uh, of, of uh, different foods, or of a single food. Um, and because of their dependence in more um, forested area, this uh, genus is likely pretty sensitive and rare. So they sit with a kind of a trap draw style. If you look at the photo, you'll see uh, elongate skinny mandibles that all sort of sit there um, open, um, almost at a 180, and they're waiting for columbula or springtails to come by in a sit and wait position and then that snaps shut. Um, so we've got everything in the system from um, interesting trophic specialists uh, to ants that uh, form symbiotic relationships with other insects, ants that are important for food sources for birds and species that also help to get and move plants around the forest floor. Lastly, um, we do have this invader. So this is Nylandaria flavipes. Unfortunately, I did find this in 100% of sample locations. And research um, or some preliminary research does show that it has the potential to disrupt um, that seed dispersal that is performed by the aphenogaster. And from inspection of different pots that come from NYC Parks nurseries, um, I have found this uh, species a uh, nest um, uh, within within the pot, suggesting that uh, it's also being spread uh, via horticultural activities within NYC parks. 
So just uh, some data from the field. Um, I'm still going through a lot of this information and my colleague uh, Christian Liriano and I are uh, looking to analyze and get all this out in a paper soon. Um, so this was a results from a study on ant nutrient use and diet. So in the beginning of the talk, I had mentioned I had used these centrifuge tubes with a cotton ball at the bottom that soaked in a certain nutrient. Uh, those different types of nutrients are listed on the x-axis on the bottom here. So I used uh, water, so soaking the um, cotton ball in water, uh, sugar, regular table uh, sugar, table salt, a lipid using olive oil as a lipid, and then glutamine as an amino acid. And so this sort of represented those eating kind of animal flesh. We've got our nectar feeders um, and sugar. Um, and so this represents um, an array of different possible nutrients that could be consumed. Um, two things to note on this graph is that there are two different locations. So blue is the Northwest forest and the orange is Vault Hill. So no matter what the um, resource actually was, um, there were a lot more ants um, hitting that resource despite what it was um, in the Vault Hill area. So the Vault Hill area is again, more open, uh, more sunnier. So having these habitats, we seem to have a greater uh, foraging capacity going on. And then also lipids seem to be uh, the major hit here. So what this suggests to us is that resources, different oils are limiting in the environment. So when we put it out there, uh, they are selecting that because there's just not enough of it in the surrounding area. So this was a bit of a surprise. So, I mean, just the null hypothesis, one would have thought that uh, sugar would have been uh, a, the number one uh, resource consumed, but it turned out being lipids. So now it's trying to use this information to circle back well, and well, looking at certain plants and, and whether they have are high in certain lipids and if we can plant them and basically how we can use this nutrient information to circle back into our uh, management and protection of natural areas within parks um, using uh, lipids potentially. This graph is showing how different water loss can vary across different species. So this was an experiment where different species represented by different colors and different letters in the legend were placed within centrifuge tubes that had a desiccate packet within it. So when you get something shipped to you um, that you want to keep dry, usually you get these little silica packets that um, come with it. Um, well, putting those inside a centrifuge tube with an ant, I then um, check the tube every 10 hours uh, for the presence of either uh, a, a mortality. And some really interesting patterns started to show up from this preliminary work. So Lassius, so which was F here, um, tend to, was they were all reached mortality after the third hour. Species like Aphenogaster and Campanotus uh, were able to reach to the 10th hour. So when we're looking at the traps, particularly the pitfall traps, I really don't end up sampling a lot of Lassius in the pitfall traps. A lot of them are actually sampled via leaf litter sifting. Now, that suggests to me that Lassius are not moving very far away from their colony sites. Could it, that be a function of the fact that they have a poor ability to maintain water like this graph is suggesting? I think it's a possibility. It's also suggesting that these more wide-ranging force, uh, wide, a wide-ranging foraging species, have a greater capacity to maintain their water. They reduce that loss, and so therefore are able to have a more wide-ranging uh, foraging uh, capacity. And so together, it looks like nutrients and water loss can have an important consequences on what ant species are actually present in a particular area. And so because we are focused at the Vancouver 
Cortland Park Alliance, a lot in restoration and management of the park. Um, basically, what I do with my research is trying to figure out how this information that I'm sort of observing can circle back into how we could better help the park as a whole. So that could be things like um, planting uh, plants uh, that contain laosomes in the seeds. That could be stuff like moving woody debris around. So these are very important nesting habitats for ants. And if we're stacking wood um, in areas, we're really not doing a, a service um, for both the nutrient cycling and uh, habitat for the biodiversity. So moving wood around, um, maintaining and even creating thermal pockets. So canopy gaps, although they tend to take on a lot of invasive uh, plant species, we do also see that there, um, there's a large response in the insect communities as well. Um, so future research, I hope to look at how exactly we can maintain a balance between within our canopy gaps between biodiversity and, and invasion. And lastly, to check planters uh, for those people that are involved in restoration that do volunteering um, if you're in the park. Um, and you're doing uh, some uh, restoration, it always helps to actually uh, just take a peek at the, the planter, the soil, about what, uh, with, uh, what you're about to plant into the ground. Um, from a more um, citizen point of view, because I realize that we're all not uh, restoration uh, people in the park, um, I urge you to download iNaturalist. Uh, this is an app um, that can be done on via any smartphone. And on top of that, I want you to sign up uh, specifically for the Van Crowland Park Biodiversity Project. I believe recently we just exceeded 10,000 observations. Um, and like I said, we do have invasive species of ants that I'd like to keep track of. And as of right now, I think I'm the only one taking pictures of uh, ants in the park. Um, so I would like to bolster those numbers. So if you're watching this and you're looking for um, an opportunity to actually uh, help out this research, uh, this app is a, is a great um, a platform to do so. And so that's it. Does anyone have any questions? If not, I'll start. I do have a question. <laughs> so Alex, when you found that the diversity was similar here in Van Cortland as it is in more rural areas, were you surprised? Uh, definitely so. Um, I, well, it, it also, it, it made me appreciate the, um, the diversity and the, um, amount of space that we have in large areas like Van Cortland Park. And after, after being surprised, you're, what soon follows is, well, how do we protect this? And, and how do we um, uh, maintain this? Um, because we do um, have very um, where, where you don't have to go uh, 40 minutes up, upstate necessarily to see the and I have one more question. <laughs> um, so what can we do to help reduce the spread of that invasive species if we're finding that it's in pots? Is there something we can do as staff and ask our volunteers to do to help with that situation? So I think that um, using uh, iNaturalist to monitor, so we're, we're in a state of trying to figure out exactly the extent of its distribution, because um, this is a fairly new species that, that has moved in recently. So we need to figure out exactly where it is. Um, and so that's, that's downloading apps like uh, iNaturalist. Um, and then once we figure out the, um, the actual extent, basically, it's going to be having to work with places like uh, the Natural Areas Conservancy, NRG, and staff over at the, the nursery 
Uh, so everybody from gardeners um, to the forestry staff uh, to nursery staff are, are aware of this um, potential um, emerging invasive. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming out and joining us. Um, we are hoping to do some more of these. We don't really know what the topics are gonna be yet, but um, but yeah, we're going to figure that out. And we did just get a question through chat. Um, which I don't know if Alex can do right here on the spot. Oh, there you go. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. So that is the centrifuge so tube that Alex used. So if you guys are also looking for like a basic citizen science sort of at home projects, um, diversity, if you're an uh, educator or any sort listening in, Basically, just take a, a cotton ball, soak it in um, either olive oil, like I've shown really works, or um, sugar water, place it at the, uh, the bottom and just set it out. Um, these things are such efficient foragers that it literally does not take a, a long time. I've had them out for an hour um, and have recovered um, you know, thousands of plants within, within a single tube. And the reason I use the centrifuge tube is that upon collection, I could just pick it up in the field, put the cap on, um, and then the without worrying about losing samples. And then also, you know, these, um, these ants bite and sting. So you want to have a rapid sort of um, capturing process. And then we just got another question How often do ants reproduce? That depends on the species. So they are all reproducing every season. Um, and so they have a very interesting um, reproduction uh, biology uh, that would take a whole other uh, lecture to get into. Um, but the basic of it are essentially, they are, are all sterile within the colony except the queen. Um, so she will be making nuptial flights um, after being uh, mated with a uh, drone. So the drones are the males. So basically if you're out right now and you see an ant with a wings, it's there in sort of, in sort of reproductive um, dance with each other. And you're looking at either a queen or a male ant. The workers are basically all sterile. Um, and to, to, to summarize, um, they're, uh, they're all going to, all the 40 plus species are going to be reproducing this year, all at um, potentially different times. Um, and something to, to, to track of would be to uh, look at and take a picture from these queens, because then you need the timing of what species, when certain species are reproducing. Okay, so last call for questions. So what's your favorite insect, Alex? <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I, think, I think dragonflies, I think I'd have to go with dragonflies, but ants come in really quick. Um, and then there's probably something on the order of, you know, 300,000 different beetles that are really cool as well. There's a lot to choose from. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming um, and being a part of this. We appreciate it and hope you all have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You're welcome, Felicity.